Chapter 4. Dinner at Fernley. It was just a few minutes before half past seven when I rang the front door bell of Fernley Park. The door was opened with admirable promptitude by Parker, the butler. The night was such a fine one that I'd preferred to come on foot. I stepped into the big square hall and Parker relieved me of my overcoat. Just then, Ackward's secretary, a pleasant young fellow by the name of Raymond, passed through the hall on his way to Ackward's study, his hands full of paper. Good evening, doctor. Come to dine, or is this a professional call? The last was in allusion to my black bag, which I had laid down in, on the oak chest. I explained that I expected a summons to a confinement case at any moment, and so had come out prepared for an emergency call. Raymond nodded and went on his way, calling over his shoulder. Go into the drawing room. You know the way. Ladies will be down in a minute. I must take these papers to Mr. Ackward, and I'll tell him you're here. On Raymond's appearance, Parker had withdrawn, so I was alone in the hall. I settled my tie, glanced in the large mirror which hung there, and crossed to the door directly facing me, which was, as I knew, the door of the drawing room. I noticed, just as I was turning the handle, a sound from within, the shutting down of a window, I took it to be. I noticed it, I may say, quite mechanically, without attaching any importance to it at the time. I opened the door and walked in. As I did so, I almost collided with Miss Russell, who was just coming out. We both apologized. For the first time, I found myself appraising the housekeeper and thinking what a handsome woman she must once have been. Indeed, as far as that goes, still was. Her dark hair was unstreaked with gray, and when she had a color, as she had at this moment, the stern quality of her looks was not so apparent. Quite subconsciously, I wondered whether she had been out, for she was breathing hard, as though she had been running. I'm afraid I'm a few minutes early, I said. Oh, I didn't think so. It's gone half past seven. Dr. Shepard, she paused a minute before saying, I didn't know you were expected to dinner tonight. Mr. Ackroyd didn't mention it. I received a vague impression that my dining there displeased her in some way, but I couldn't imagine why. How's the knee? I inquired. Much the same, thank you, doctor. I must be going now. Mrs. Ackward will be down in a moment. I, I only came in to here to see if the flowers were all right. She passed quickly out of the room. I strolled to the window, wondering at her evident desire to justify her presence in the room. As I did so, I saw what, of course, I might have known all the time I had troubled to give to my... Wait, what? I might have known all the time had I troubled to give my mind to it, namely, that the windows were long French ones opening on the terrace. The sound I had heard, therefore, could not have been that of a window being shut down. Quite idly, and more to distract my mind from painful thoughts than for any other reason, I amused myself by trying to guess what could have caused the sound in question. Coals on the fire? No, that was not the kind of noise at all. A drawer of a bureau being pushed in. No, not that. Then my eye was caught by what, I believe, is called a silver table, the lid of which lifts, and through the glass of which you can see the contents. I crossed over to it, studying the contents. There were one or two pieces of old silver, a baby shoe belonging to King Charles I, some Chinese jade figures, and quite a number of African implements and curios. Wanting to examine one of the jade figures more closely, I lifted the lid. It slipped through my fingers and fell. At once, I recognized the sound I had heard. It was this same table lid being shut down gently and carefully. I repeated the action once or twice for my own satisfaction. Then I lifted the lid to scrutinize the contents more closely. I was still bending over the open silver table when Flora Ackroyd came into the room. Quite a lot of people do not like Flora Ackroyd, but nobody can help admiring her. And to her friends, she can be very charming. The first thing that strikes you about her is her extraordinary fairness. 
She has the real Scandinavian pale gold hair. Her eyes are blue, blue as the waters of a Norwegian fjord, and her skin is cream and roses. She has square boyish shoulders and slight hips. And to a jaded medical man, it is very refreshing to come across such perfect health. A simple, straightforward English girl. I may be old fashioned, but I think the genuine article takes a lot of beating. Flora joined me by the silver table and expressed her radical doubts as to King Charles I ever having worn the baby shoe. And anyway, continued Miss Fleur, all this making a fuss about things because someone wore or used them seems to me all nonsense. They're not wearing or using them now. That pen that George Eliot wrote The Mill on the Floss with, that sort of thing, well, it's only just a pen after all. If you're really keen on George Eliot, why not get The Mill on the Floss in a cheap edition and read it? I suppose you've never read such out of old, out-of-date stuff, Miss Flora. You're wrong, Dr. Shepherd. I love the mill on the floss. I was rather pleased to hear it. The things young women read nowadays and profess to enjoy positively frightened me. You haven't congratulated me yet, Dr. Shepherd, said Flora. Haven't you heard? She held out her left hand. On the third finger of it was an exquisitely set pearl. I'm going to marry Ralph, you know. She went on. Uncle is very pleased. It keeps me in the family, you see. I took both her hands in mine. My dear, I said, I hope you'll be very happy. We've been engaged for about a month, continued Flora in her cool voice, but it was only announced yesterday. Uncle is going to do up cross stones and give it to us to live in, and we're going to pretend to farm. Really, we shall hunt all the winter, town for the season, and then go yachting. I love the sea, and of course I shall take great interest in the parish affairs and attend all the mother's meetings. Just then, Mrs. Ackroyd rustled in, full of apologies for being late. I am sorry to dis say I detest Mrs. Ackroyd. She is all chains and teeth and bones, a most unpleasant woman. She has small, pale, flinty blue eyes, and however gushing her words may be, those eyes of hers always remain coldly speculative. I went across to her, leaving Flora by the window. She gave me a handful of assorted knuckles and rings to squeeze and began talking volubly. Had I heard about Flora's engagement, so suitable in every way, the dear young things had fallen in love at first sight, such a perfect pair, so her, he's so dark and she's so fair. I can tell you, my dear Miss Dr. Shepherd, the relief to a mother's heart. Mrs. Ackroyd sighed, a tribute to her mother's heart, while her eyes remained shrewdly observant of me. I was wondering, you're such an old friend of dear Roger's. We know how much he trusts your judgment. So difficult for me in my position as poor Cecil's widow. But there's so many tiresome things, settlements, you know, all that. I fully believe that Roger intends to make settlements upon dear Flora, but as you know, he is just a little peculiar about money. Very usual, I've heard, amongst men who are captains of industry. I wondered, you know, if you could just sound him on the subject. Fleur is so fond of you. We feel you're quite an old friend, although we have only really known you just over two years. Mrs. Ackroyd's eloquence was cut short as the drawing room door opened once more. I was pleased at the interruption. I hate interfering in other people's affairs, and I had not the least intention of tackling Ackroyd on the subject of Flora's settlements. In another moment, I should have been forced to tell Mrs. Ackroyd as much. You know Major Blunt, don't you, Doctor? Yes, indeed, I said. A lot of people know Hector Blunt, at least by repute. He has shot more wild animals in unlikely places than any man living, I suppose. When you mention him, people say, Blunt, you don't mean the big game man, do you? His friendship with Ackroyd has always puzzled me a little. The two men are so totally dissimilar. Hector Blunt is perhaps five years Ackroyd's junior, 
They made friends early in life, and though their ways have diverged, the friendship still holds. About once in two years, Blunt spins a fortnight at Fernley, and an immense animal's head, with an amazing number of horns which fixes you with a glazed stare as soon as you come inside the front door, is a permanent reminder of the friendship. Blunt had entered the room now with his own peculiar, deliberate, yet soft-footed tread. He is a man of medium height, sturdily and rather stockily built. His face is almost mahogany-colored and is peculiarly expressionless. He has gray eyes that give the impression of always watching something that is happening very far away. He talks little, and what he does say is jerkily, as though the words were forced out of him unwillingly. He said now, How are you, Shepherd? in his usual abrupt fashion, and then stood squarely in front of the fireplace, looking over our heads as though he saw something very interesting happening in Timbuktu. Major Blunt, said Flora. Oh, the daughter. I wish you'd tell me about these African things. I'm sure you know what they all are. I've heard Hector Blunt described as a woman hater, but I noticed that he joined Flora at the silver table with what might be described as alacrity. They bent over it together. I was afraid Mrs. Ackroyd would begin talking about settlements again, so I made a few hurried remarks about the new sweet pea. I knew there was a new sweet pea because the Daily Mail had told me so that morning. Mrs. Ackroyd knows nothing about horticulture, but she is the kind of woman who likes to appear well-informed about the topics of the day, and she, too, reads the Daily Mail. We were able to converse quite intelligently until Ackroyd and his secretary joined us, and immediately afterwards, Parker announced dinner. My place at table was between Mrs. Ackroyd and Flora. Blunt was on Mrs. Ackroyd's other side, and Geoffrey Raymond next to him. Dinner was not a cheerful affair. Ackroyd was visibly preoccupied. He looked wretched and ate next to nothing. Mrs. Ackroyd, Raymond, and I kept the conversation going. Flora seemed affected by her uncle's depression, and Blunt relapsed into his usual taciturnity. Immediately after dinner, Ackroyd slipped his arm through mine and led me off to his study. Once we've had coffee, we shan't be disturbed again, he explained. I told Raymond to see to it that we shouldn't be interrupted. I studied him quietly without appearing to do so. He was clearly under the influence of some strong excitement. For a minute or two, he paced up and down the room. Then, as Parker entered with the coffee tray, he sank into an armchair in front of the fire. The study was a comfortable apartment. Bookshelves lined one wall of it. The chairs were big and covered in dark blue leather. A large desk stood by the window and was covered with papers neatly docketed and filed. On a round table were various magazines and sporting papers. I've had a return of that pain after food lately, remarked Ackroyd calmly as he helped himself to coffee. You must give me some more of those tablets of yours. It struck me that he was anxious to convey the impression that our conference was a medical one. I played up accordingly. I thought as much. I brought some up with me. Good man, hand them over now. They're in my bag in the hall. I'll get them. Ackroyd arrested me. Don't you trouble. Parker will get them. Bring in the doctor's bag, will you, Parker? Very good, sir. Parker withdrew. As I was about to speak, Ackroyd threw up his hand. Not yet. Wait. Don't you see I'm in such a state of nerves that I can hardly contain myself? I saw that plainly enough, and I was very uneasy. All sorts of forebodings assailed me. Ackroyd spoke again, almost immediately. Make certain that window's closed, will you? he asked. Somewhat surprised, I got up and went to it. It was not a French window, but one of the ordinary sash type. The heavy blue velvet curtains were drawn in front of it, but the window itself was open at the top. Parker re-entered the room with my bag while I was still at the window. That's all right, I said, emerging again into the room. You've put the latch across. Yes, yes. What's the matter with you, Ackroyd? The door had just closed behind Parker, or I would not have put the question. 
Ackroyd waited a minute before replying. I'm in hell, he said slowly after a minute. No, don't bother with those damn tablets. I only said that for Parker. Servants are so curious. Come here and sit down. The door's closed too, isn't it? Yes, nobody can overhear. Don't be uneasy. Shepard, nobody knows what I've gone through in the last 24 hours. If a man's house ever fell in ruin about him, mine has about me. This business of Ralph's is the last straw. But we won't talk about that now. It's the other. The other. I don't know what to do about it. And I've got to make up my mind soon. What's the trouble? Ackroyd remained silent for a minute or two. He seemed curiously averse to begin. When he did speak, the question he asked came as a complete surprise. It was the last thing I expected. Shepard, you attended Ashley Ferrer's in his last illness, didn't you? Yes, I did. He seemed to find even greater difficulty in framing his next question. Did you ever suspect, did it ever enter your head that, well, that he might have been poisoned? I was silent for a minute or two. Then I made up my mind what to say. Roger Ackroyd was not Caroline. I'll tell you the truth, I said. At the time, I had no suspicion whatever, but since... Well, it was mere idle talk on my sister's part that first put the idea into my head. Since then, I haven't been able to get it out again. But mind you, I've no foundation whatever for that suspicion. He was poisoned, said Ackroyd. He spoke in a dull, heavy voice. Who by? I asked sharply. His wife. How do you know that? She told me so herself. When? Yesterday. My God, yesterday. It seems ten years ago. I waited a minute. Then he went on. You understand, Shepherd. I'm telling you this in confidence. It's to go no further. I want your advice. I can't carry the whole weight by myself. As I said just now, I don't know what to do. Can you tell me the whole story? I said. I'm still in the dark. How did Mrs. Ferrers come to make this confession to you? It's like this. Three months ago, I asked Mrs. Ferrers to marry me. She refused. I asked her again, and she consented. But she refused to allow me to make the engagement public until her year of mourning was up. Yesterday, I called upon her, pointed out that a year and three weeks had now elapsed since her husband's death and that there could be no further objection to making the engagement public property. I had noticed that she had been very strange in her manner for some days. Now suddenly, without the least warning, she broke down completely. She, she told me everything. Her hatred of her brute of a husband, her growing love for me, and the, the dreadful means she had taken. Poison! My God! It was murder in cold blood. I saw the repulsion, the horror in Ackroyd's face. So Mrs. Ferrers must have seen it. Ackroyd is not the type of the great lover who can forgive all for love's sake. He is fundamentally a good citizen. All that was sound and wholesome and law-abiding in him must have turned from her utterly in that moment of revelation. Yes, he went on in a low, monotonous voice. She confessed everything. It seems that there is one person who has known all along, who has been blackmailing her for huge sums. It was the strain of that that drove her nearly mad. Who is the man? Suddenly, before my eyes, there arose the picture of Ralph Payton and Mrs. Ferrers side by side, their heads so close together. I felt a momentary throb of anxiety, supposing, oh, but surely that was impossible. I remembered the frankness of Ralph's greeting that very afternoon. Absurd. She wouldn't tell me his name, said Ackroyd slowly. As a matter of fact, 
She didn't actually say that it was a man. But of course, of course, I agreed. It must have been a man. And you've no suspicion at all. For answer, Ackroyd groaned and dropped his head into his hands. It can't be, he said. I'm mad to even think of such a thing. No, I won't even admit to you the wild suspicion that crossed my mind. I'll tell you this much, though. Something she said made me think that the person in question might, actu might be actually among my household. But that can't be so. I must have misunderstood her. What did you say to her? I asked. What could I say? She saw, of course, the awful shock it had been to me. And then there was the question, what was my duty in the matter? She had made me, you see, an accessory after the fact. She saw all that, I think, quicker than I did. I was stunned, you know. She asked me for 24 hours, made me promise to do nothing till the end of that time, and she steadfastly refused to give me the name of the scoundrel who had been blackmailing her. I suppose she was afraid that I might go straight off and hammer him, and then the fat would have been in the fire as far as she was concerned. She told me that I should hear from her before twenty-four hours had passed. My God! I swear to you, Shepherd, that it had never entered my head what she meant to do. Suicide! And I drove her to it. No, no, I said. Don't take an exaggerated view of things. The responsibility for her death doesn't lie at your door. The question is, what am I to do now? The poor lady is dead. Why rake up past trouble? I rather agree with you, I said. But there's another point. How am I to get hold of that scoundrel who drove her to death as surely as if he'd killed her? He knew of the first crime, and he fastened on to it like some obscene vulture. She's paid the penalty. Is he to go scot-free? I see, I said slowly. You want to hunt him down. It will mean a lot of publicity, you know. Yes, I've thought of that. I've zigzagged to and fro in my mind. I agree with you that the villain ought to be punished, but the cost has got to be reckoned. Ackroyd rose and walked up and down. Presently, he sank into the chair again. Look here, Shepherd. Suppose we leave it like this. If no word comes from her, we'll let the dead things lie. What do you mean by word coming from her? I asked curiously. I have the strongest impression that somewhere or somehow she must have left a message for me before she went can't argue about it, but there it is. I shook my head. She left no letter or word of any kind? I asked. Shepherd, I'm convinced that she did. And more, I've a feeling that by deliberately choosing death, she wanted the whole thing to come out, if only to be revenged on the man who drove her to desperation. I believe that if I could have seen her then, she would have told me his name and bid me go for him for all I was worth. He looked at me. You don't believe in impressions? Oh, yes, I do, in a sense. If, as you put it, words should come from her. I broke off. The door opened noiselessly, and Parker entered with a salver, on which were some letters. The evening post, sir, he said, handing the salver to Ackroyd. Then he collected the coffee cups and withdrew. My attention, diverted for a moment, came back to Ackroyd. He was staring like a man turned to stone at a long blue envelope. The other letters he had let drop to the ground. Her writing, he said in a whisper. She must have gone out and posted it last night, just before, before. 
He ripped open the envelope and drew out a thick enclosure. Then he looked up sharply. You're sure you shut the window? He said. Quite sure, I said, surprised. Why? All this evening I've had a queer feeling of being watched, spied upon. What's that? He turned sharply. So did I. We both had the impression of hearing the latch of the door give ever so slightly. I went across to it and opened it. There was no one there. Nerves, murmured Ackroyd to himself. He unfolded the thick sheets of paper, read aloud in a low voice. My dear, my very dear Roger, a life calls for a life, I see that. I saw it in your face this afternoon, so I am taking the only road open to me. I leave to you the punishment of the person who has made my life a hell upon earth for the last year. I would not tell you the name this afternoon, but I propose to write it to you now. I have no children or near relations to be spared, so do not fear publicity. If you can, Roger, my very dear Roger, forgive me the wrong I meant to do you, since when the time came, I could not do it after all. Ackroyd his finger on the sheet to turn it over, paused. Shepherd, forgive me, but I must read this alone, he said unsteadily. It was meant for my eyes and my eyes only. He put the letter in the envelope and laid it on the table. Later, when I am alone. No, I cried impulsively, read it now. Ackroyd stared at me in some surprise. I beg your pardon, I said, reddening. I do not mean read it aloud to me, but read it through whilst I am still here. Ackroyd shook his head. No, I'd rather wait. But for some reason, obscure to myself, I continued to urge him. At least read the name of the man, I said. Now, Ackroyd is essentially pig-headed. The more you urge him to do a thing, the more determined he is not to do it. All my arguments were in vain. The letter had been brought in at 20 minutes to 9. It was just on 10 minutes to 9 when I left him, the letter still unread. I hesitated with my hand on the door handle, looking back and wondering if there was anything I had left undone. I could think of nothing. With a shake of the head, I passed out and closed the door behind me. I was startled by seeing the figure of Parker close at hand. He looked embarrassed, and it occurred to me that he might have been listening at the door. What a fat, smug, oily face the man had. And surely there was something decidedly shifty in his eye. Mr. Ackroyd particularly does not want to be disturbed. I said coldly. He told me to tell you so. Quite so, sir. I, I fancied I heard the bell ring. This was such a palpable untruth that I did not trouble to reply. Preceding me to the hall, Parker helped me on with my overcoat, and I stepped out into the night. The moon was overcast, and everything seemed very dark and still. The village church clock chimed nine o'clock as I passed through the lodge gates. I turned to the left towards the village and almost cannoned into a man coming in the opposite direction. This the way to Friendly Park, mister, asked the stranger in a hoarse voice. I looked at him. He was wearing a hat pulled down over his eyes and his coat collar turned up. I could see little or nothing of his face, but he seemed a young fellow. The voice was rough and uneducated. These are the lodge gates here, I said. Thank you, mister. He paused and then added quite unnecessarily. I'm a stranger in these parts, you see. He went on, passing through the gates as I turned to look after him. The odd thing was that his voice reminded me of someone's voice that I knew, but whose it was I could not think. Ten minutes later, I was at home once more. Caroline was full of curiosity to know why I had returned so early. I had to make up a slightly fictitious account of the evening in order to satisfy her, and I had an uneasy feeling that she saw through the transparent device. At ten o'clock I rose, yawned, and suggested bed. 
Caroline acquiesced. It was Friday night, and on Friday night I wind the clocks. I did it as usual, whilst Caroline satisfied herself that the servants had locked up the kitchen properly. It was a quarter past ten as we went up the stairs. I had just reached the top when the telephone rang in the hall below. Mrs. Bates, said Caroline immediately. I'm afraid so, I said ruefully. I ran down the stairs and took up the receiver. What? I said. What? Certainly, I'll come at once. I ran upstairs, caught up my bag, and stuffed a few extra dressings into it. Parker telephoning, I shouted to Caroline, from Fernley. They've just found Roger Ackroyd murdered. 